So we had a uh, interesting uh, thread on the mailing list a uh, little while back. And uh, for some reason, it was decided that I give a presentation here. But uh, you know, it's it's the usual thing. If you have if you talk in LKML, you you have everybody else talking too. So uh, thank you for providing a realistic uh, view of that for a little bit. Uh, in any case, what I'm going to do here is a little bit different than what I normally do. Uh, first off, we got a whole bunch of people contributed in the mailing list. Uh, the bottom URL is kind of a design document that uh, catches a very rough first view of some of the things we could do to RCU based on that discussion. Of course, what we could do, do to RCU and what we should do to RCU are not necessarily one and the same. Okay, uh, So I'm going to emphasize up front, uh, if we're going to make complicated changes to RCU, we need to see a real problem and see a real solution to the problem, or that as a real solution to the problem. All right. Um, the big thing, the big concern is that uh, we could have a problem. We, this has happened in the past, so this is not an unfounded uh, concern. We could have a problem where RCU was too slow and uh, things didn't get processed quickly enough and we ran out of memory. So what can be done about that both within RCU and without and what do we do to figure out if we're in danger of that happening? So I'm going to go through this stuff first really quickly. Okay, really quickly. Um, and the point of this isn't, the point of this is to see what people are interested in. I mean, if I go through it slide by slide, I know this group, I know me, all right? We're going to rat hole on the first thing. And that might be the best possible outcome, maybe, but, you know, let's at least give the other topics a chance, all right? So, uh, uh, the, and so I may go through it twice, depending on what goes on really quickly, just to get people on it was there. Okay, the first thing is, what's RCU? You guys have seen slides like this before. The key thing... <laughs> One of them was new. Can somebody tell me which one? Uh, uh, aside from this one, which is also new. So the, if you want to think of RCU in an abstract sense, for the purposes of this presentation, just think of it as a kind of a big pool into which requests go, and indications come out later when it's safe. And uh, that's how it works. It's been working this way for a very long time, uh, more than 20 years in Linux kernel and another 10 years in Dynamics PTX before that, and even more in, uh, in uh, IBM's... Uh, VMXA hypervisor, um, but what if that happens? We get lots of requests. Can RCU keep up? That's the big question. Okay, so uh, one thing is with what exactly? Uh, there's a synthetic benchmark I ran just to kind of get an eye on that, uh, and you should run your own benchmarks because the kernel build is wonderful. Uh, but, okay, uh, there's some things we could do some problems that could be occurring and what we can do about them. Uh, there's a possibility of tracking RCU's memory footprint with some complications on the particular workload I was running. Maybe yours is different. Uh, what we could do to track them. Uh, there's a long chunk of this is on polled RCU grace periods, which talking to people might be a solution if we have a problem. Uh, this is something that is already in RCU that could be used. All right. And this is, uh, I actually presented on this two years ago here. And then a year, a year and a half ago at Alps, uh, in the Alps. Uh, so that's kind of what we've been through. And then the idea is we have your ideas there. Okay, uh, how many votes for me going through that again so that you can kind of see what's going on? <laughs> okay, we'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> if I can find the home key. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> I just wanted to show you what's possible, Steve. <laughs> I didn't necessarily be showing you what is good to do, just what's possible. <laughs> okay, so let's go through that again. So we've got some stuff on what's RCU, and you get another chance to see the new slide there, aside from these two. And again, the question is, if we get whole piles of requests, have we got a situation RCU just can't keep up and we OOM? And that's not, that's a workload dependent question, right? Um, so uh, I can't answer that question for everybody, right? <laughs> I need you guys to help. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, uh, first thing is what are we keeping up with? In other words, what's your workload and what, how did it break? I had kernel build, which had certain properties. Then we got a, some reasons why RC might fail to keep up. Too long readers, normal race periods are actually slow by design for reasons. 
Um, there's things RCU does to, if it has an emergency where it thinks OEMs are happening, and that, some of those might not be adequate, maybe, uh, but you need to show me, right? And then uh, expedited grace periods are wonderful things, but they don't do anything for the normal callbacks, and that's something we could fix. Okay, so we have more detail on all those and what you can do about them. Uh, there's tracking memory footprint, which was discussed, and it's not a bad idea, it's just that we have some challenges. Um, and some other ways of doing it. And then again, we've got the poll grace periods. I'll go through that a little more quickly this time. Okay, so. Um, Uh, we could do that. Uh, background on the current discussion. Why don't you why don't you say your piece here, Kent? There was a microphone though first. This came out of uh, the buffered IO form discussion. Buffered IO form, so I'll try to make that faster. This goes back to 4K page overhead being a thing, and we've got rid of 4K page overhead. Uh, thank you, Matthew, but we still want to make buffered IO performance as fast as possible. There's put people pushing DIO at like 100 gigabytes plus a second, and if buffered I.O. is slower, then that's a bug. So buffered read path is pretty fast these days, but right now we do a radix tree walk, we uh, grab a folio ref, we do the copy, we blow away L1, and then we drop that ref. So we're noticing we can make, this, make the buffered read path significantly faster if we do it under RCU. That requires our RCU freeing page cache pages. Page cache pages are most of the memory in the system. If we're RCU free and uh, page cache pages, also at that point, maybe we should just RCU free everything? That has been done in a research operating system. <laughs> um, so uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the things that would be really cool is if it's possible or feasible, just take that path and, and force those pages to go through RCU for no reason. And, and see if it breaks. If it breaks, we got something we can look at and investigate. Uh, okay, so how do we want to proceed here? One would be to say, okay, um, there, there's a problem. What could be the cause of it? Go ahead, Joe. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. Why like, I'm, I'm sure there's these. places here where we can make RCU better for this style of problem, but it feels to me like this is making RCU solve a problem that's not necessarily RCU's fault, right? Because we have all sorts of things that can take a long time, right? Write back takes a long mm -hmm. time. Like there's all sorts of like, give me memory back things that are gonna take some time and we could OM the system because those things don't take the amount of time we want them to take, right? RCU would just be a new one in this bucket so it feels like to me we're trying to solve like a problem that's not RCU specific. It's that page reclaim is going to take a lot, like comes in all sorts of different sizes like or whatever. Mic? And maybe we should. Thank you. Uh, Kent, Mike. Yeah. There we are. Well, that's, that's why it's the interactions dis uh, discussion. And yes, memory reclaim is, is a hard problem and it's, it's also kind of the bucket that is, does, doesn't feel like any one person's responsibility. As a file system developer, I get stuck debugging a lot of issues that are reclaim in some way, and I find that we just don't have enough introspection to even fully understand where in the, in the stack, like shrinkers, it could be yet, yet another thing, the, the issue is. So I think of this as a wider interaction Discussion. Sure. I'm only prepared. I'll, I'll freely confess. Uh, why don't we get somebody to actually run the mic around? Uh, somebody young and, and enthusiastic. And well, we did offer catch boxes, but you all declined. The, there is a bigger question, which is, is it really appropriate for us to use RCU in this way? As in, since we're trying to bend the use case out and we will have these long tail write back things, it, would we just be better off not bothering with RCU and just inventing our own mechanism for it, which is effectively what page cache flushing does. The, the other, Linus thinks other so. Possi excuse me, another possibility would be use a different type of RCU. SRCU, for example, uh, wouldn't visit the long things on anybody else, although your point probably is also that the lo visiting long things on itself is going to be a problem, but still. Go ahead, Kent, sorry. prototype the code for the uh, RCU buffer, uh, generic file buffered read. Okay. 
What, what happened when he did that? <laughs> okay, that sounds worth going after. What's, what's the best way to, to attack this? I guess that's the real question. We got, this, we got this potential pass from Linus, which might be good, might not, who knows. Might have unforeseen consequences, uh, or even foreseen ones. Is this another RC flavor? Um, I don't think so. But let's hear what Dave has to say. Oh, I'm confused. I don't understand what problem we're actually talking about here or trying to solve. We're trying to solve making buffer cache faster, I think. But uh, Ken will correct me if I'm well, wrong. And Willie might have a perspective as well. So the problem, the problem we're trying to solve is that for some workloads, it is prohibitively expensive to take the ref count on the folio and then drop it again when doing small reads out of the page cache. Atomic Ops, when you're doing a bunch of copies mixed in with that, blowing away cache lines in L1, are surprisingly expensive. OK, one other possibility, given that rough description, is something called hazard pointers, which we have some people working on making an implementation of a Linux kernel. Um, and what that is is it's kind of an inside-out reference count. So you take a reference by writing a pointer to, a lo to local storage. And you have reclamation kind of like RCU, but instead of waiting for all readers to get done, uh, you have the readers kind of indicating which object they're paying attention to. And, you, and if you have a thing you're saying, can I free this yet? If none of the pointers point to it, you're golden. And then there's a funny, complicated dance that has to happen to make uh, this actually work correctly. Um, the downside of that is, is that, and so if you're used to reference counts, it's probably OK. Um, is that if, if with RCU, you say RC read lock, and you just plow through the data structure, and, and it keeps the stuff around, and, and you're good. With this, it's going to be like some reference counting workloads or algorithms, where you say, OK, I want to go to the next one, and say, no, you can't, OK, because that's gone already. Um, but again, if you're using reference counts, you may already have that code to take care of that, in which case, that might be a good match. The advantage, the, 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 that's the pain. The advantage is that you, own, that you can free anything that's not currently being referenced right now, whereas RCU is going to wait for everything, all readers to get done, whether they're referencing the thing you care about or not. And that's, that's a trade-off, right? With RCU, you get the unconditional traversal. With hazard pointers, you get a smaller memory footprint. Again, we got, uh, I think it's Bushun Fung is here, um, working on an early, hey, he's right there, working on an early prototype of this. Go ahead. I, 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 th I, think, I think we actually need this question asked into a microphone. Ken, could you run the microphone over to James? <laughs> so the cost in atomics Human is conversion of the cache line to exclusive, which you occur once, and then every time there's contention, right? If, there's, if, the, if it's uncontended, it's an initial setup cost for atomics and nothing else. So the question for your workload is, how much contention actually is there in this reader writer thing, because if there's no contention, it affects the way we should solve the problem. If there's huge contention, then yeah, it's sort of, this is a problem we need to. I'll, I'll, my steps in. <laughs> I'll just come over here. <laughs> Even in the no contention case, this is an issue because CPU caches are not fully associative. Stop it. Microphones. <laughs> You guys can't stand a cost close to each converting other. converting the line to exclusive, but once it's exclusive and you're only operating on a single CPU, there is no further cost to an atomic operation, right? So it's a single setup cost in that case. I, I think you may be underestimating just how many places call folio get, folio put, put page, get page, and other similar things. There's well, a lot of ref counts. But that's, what, that's why I was asking about the problem use case, because if there's a lot of contention, atomics are massively expensive. You're absolutely correct, because the line is flipping from exclusive to shared to exclusive and everything as people use it. But if there's no contention, there may be another way of solving it. Uh, the, the benchmarks I did, I and Linus did, I think I benchmarked the code that Linus wrote. It was like 50% faster, and that was purely single-threaded. It was, it was pretty short. I'm not disputing the benchmarks of the fact that we could get uh, benefit from this. I'm asking what the use case is where we saw the benefit and whether we could get it in a different way than having to torture RCU, although Paul is very keen on doing that. Well, uh, again, we have other algorithms that can be applied, but we have to understand the situation well enough. Um, my, my big uh, ask, before we jump into new algorithms and new solutions, I would just like to get some numbers on the problem. Uh, when I'm debugging memory or claim interactions, I want to know 
what part of the the whole memory reclaim path got stalled and why and for how long and how much memory got stranded. Uh, all I need to be happy is just some numbers and how much memory is waiting to be RCU freed. Um, and uh, so yeah, that, that's, hey, I can actually go through on some of these slides more slowly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I know you guys are used to me blasting through them and this might cause trouble, but. Uh... <laughs> Track RCU reclaim. Yeah, that's, that's a risk you have to take, James. You might understand me. <laughs> okay, so this is a kernel build, all right? And uh, uh, what I did was I, I took a, a script, a BPF script, and just collected how quickly these things are being called. And these are all grace period primitives. And of these, the reason, that, can somebody tell me why k free call RCU is green? And none of the rest are? That is the sole, the only RCU grace period mechanism that has any clue of the size of the object being freed. And it's worth 0.3% of the calls during a kernel build. And call RCU has no clue. You hand it a pointer and it doesn't know what the heck the thing is. In fact, you might have a list you're passing to it. It doesn't know. Um, and so if, if, we, if this changes, we can do something. As it stands now, um, it's not helping. Uh, in addition, so, uh, uh, and again, the, the other thing is that we don't have per subsystem accounting. Now, that could be provided on top, or maybe we should introduce that. I don't think we want to increase the size of the RCU head, but there's no law saying we can't put the RCU head inside of some bigger thing that has more information. Uh, so if we were to somehow make, you know, the user have to tell, call RCU how much memory is being freed, it can't figure it out. The same with synchronized RCU, even more so. Um, but if we did that, we could do something like that, and we could uh, have some indication in there somewhere of who the heck this thing belongs to. Right now, RCU just gets a request and has no idea how it relates to anything else it's doing. So wait, you're trying to figure out, is this for accounting to see how much RCU is being freed? So I'm, I'm, being, I'm being asked to tell people how much stuff is waiting. So I'm saying, can't you then do tracing of the callback, of the RCU callback, and see what gets freed, and then just measure what's freed from the callback? You can do that now, but I think that they want to do it dynamically on the system running all the time in order to have the subsystem react and avoid disaster in addition and that to may RCU. Not, well, still, you probably could do that without much expense. Um, Go ahead. I actually actually like the idea of the per subsystem accounting. I'd rather would a per scope accounting, not so much subsystem. That we have something like whatever, like a static thing, um, which you could define, and then it'll be anything will be tracked based on that static thing which you defined. Um, that would help for quite some use cases where we where uh, um, synchronous RCU is currently hurting us a lot, like NVMe for the namespaces to rescan namespaces in the device map. We've seen it quite heavily mm -hmm. um, that they have some pointer magic they need to clean up, but this only is related to specific subsystems. And so if we could have, have a method, method of defining a subsystem and then make all RCU case based on that one, that would be awesome. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're asking before you leave the mic on us. Um, are, are you saying you want per subsystem tagging or per namespace tagging or both or what? No, I just... Uh, uh, Independent of that, just having a whatever a global identifier, right? I define a subsystem X, mm -hmm. and then having a synchronized, having all the RCU case related to that subsystem, all and that, thereby you can just encapsulate. Then you have a scope for the mm -hmm. synchronized RCU, and then you can call synchronized RCU for that specific scope, okay, ignoring so, everything else. So let me make sure I understand. It sounded like what you're saying is there's a global variable. Uh, per, th per per CPU that says which go which subsystem we're in. Yeah, just that, has, it, that now it's going to have to be saved and restored on interrupts, right? Yeah. So uh, per I'm, subsystem accounting, we could probably do as a simple addition to memory allocation profiling. It's about good. to get merged. Um, okay, so at that point, the subsystem ID is is on the uh, uh, on the memory itself. Do I understand that correctly? The, the free might be dependent on, on another subsystem finishing something. So even if you do the accounting, uh, you, can, you may see one subsystem having lots of stuff not being freed, would, but because of someone else. I and that's the dependency you would want to see. 
I would consider this an error because that means you have some unknown side effects. No, you're just waiting for IOs. This is the most simple thing ever. Mm, not necessarily. No, you're not, not necessarily. For example, I'm, I'm saying. No, in, in, no, no, you're not waiting for IOs. Uh, not in my case. So what you're waiting for is basically for a concurrent processes running in the same thing or in the same area to complete. I mean, that's what synchronous RCU does. And uh, just to ensure that everything, everything who could potentially hit the RCU protect areas have been pushed out. That's what synchronous RCU does. And, uh, but that, as it's a global one, we have a global blaster radius, so we have to wait for everything. If we could reduce the blaster radius there, I guess. Yeah, but back to my point, the, the freeing might be depending on completing another subsystem uh, uh, RCU uh, critical so, section. So basically, I'm just saying it's for accounting, right? That you're basically doing for, you, well, you want to know how much your subsystem's free and all that. So basically, I you know call RCU's, uh, the function that's called by call RCU is done in soft interrupt, right? Usually. The, well, well so, uh, it can be, or, or it's called within the. the but basically, that, the you can have preemption thing, the disabled. Thing that invokes the callback. Yeah, if, to, if it's not real time or whatever, it's usually like the callback would be in a soft IRQ. Usually it's, it's, it's going to either be in soft IRQ environments, K soft IRQD, or right. in one of the So RCO basically, it could be in a preempt disabled environment. So basically, what you could do is when call RCU comes in, you, you know, preempt, if disable preemption, mark what the function is, have a little set of flag that every K free will say, okay, um, if this flag's set, call this function over here to say what I'm freeing, and you already know what function the, so you can actually label every function, every callback function, mm -hmm. how much it frees. So at least you can have a table or something on the background and do this on a live system. It shouldn't be that expensive because it's just checking a per CPU bit. Well, we can certainly do that with BPF uh, scripts really easily. If you uh, want to do that too, yeah, but then, but, like I said, it's either way or have something just hard coded, it'd probably be quick. I mean, that'd be pretty trivial to actually get this information. So. Uh, uh, have some kind of um, uh, so, but the the th thing I'm curious about though, it's I mean that we can do that, but uh, aren't there cases where multiple subsystems share a callback function? But they, yeah, maybe yes. yes. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. So like, uh, it sounds free. like it sounds like the information has to be on the memory itself for yeah. the, all the so, use cases to work. So Go that's ahead, exactly what I was about to say. We're talking about tracking uh, memory objects that are in flight in being freed. We track things in the slab mm -hmm. uh, caches, for example, how many objects have been allocated, how many are in the partial lists, how many are you know, in, in different states. Um, this seems to me like you know, we have an object, we're going to free it, we know it came from, the, whoever's freeing it knows it came from a slab cache. Mm -hmm. uh, why not just account for RCU freeze in a slab cache? You know, these are the numbers of we, we can items make it more that are in grain. flight. CERN and I have about to land, about to get merged this cycle. Memory, per call site, memory allocation profiling, right. proc alloc info, we can just make it another column in that. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing looking at here is we're talking about random subsystems tracking random things when what we're actually trying to do is track objects that actually know what slab they belong to. And in knowing what slab they belong to, they know what size they are. They know what node they belong to. They know all of these things. And that's all we can get to from the actual object itself. Because mm -hmm. the backing folio has a pointer back to the slab that they belong to. That's how the free, freeing code works. So we've already got all sorts of stats about how they're being used in memory and what mm -hmm. the current footprint is. So why not just add a, another stat that says there's this many objects in RCU free for this slab? Okay, let, let me. I'm proc sorry, slab info then tells us everything. Let me make sure. I don't know the slab allocator that well, so I'm going to ask you, ask somebody a question anyway. If if we did that, would I be doing something like when you invoke call R RCU, I call something saying, "Hey, this thing is now waiting for RCU." Would that be the changes um, in RCU? I, I think like we have K free R RCU. Mm -hmm. We yeah. put that code to determine what slab it belonged to in K free RCU. Is this a slab object? Yes. Okay. Account it as RCU in flight to that slab. Oh, don't I want to and do then, the same then, thing for then call, RCU. call RCU? Yeah. Okay, but except call RCU is a little more complicated because I have no idea what the heck the thing is. It might well, be static. But you, memory. you don't need to know about that. 
the object okay. knows what it is. Okay, so I call some function and it parses yeah. so, out what it, what it so, is. No, and we we does call K3RCU. K3RCU has another little code, a bit of code in it that determines what slab it belongs to, does the accounting, and then it does whatever RCU does with it, queues it, and so on. And when the callback mm -hmm. is run to actually free it, that decrements the uh, RCUs in flight. Okay. Along with, you know, now, now um, uh, one of the things that I wouldn't mind is actually if the KCRCU, K-free RCU stuff got merged into the slab allocators, because it's from RCU's viewpoint, it's kind of this thing yeah. that uh, uses RCU. So if we did that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, if we, so if we I, mean, I, I don't see this as being a separate problem to, this is an RCU problem. This is more just a slab accounting problem, yeah. which takes into account you know, all your heap, all of your slab caches, everything like that. Um, so if we've got that tracking. No, no, the. Well, the, the things he's talking about, k rcu knows more than call RCU does. Yeah. Um, and, in K, and as Kent pointed out, in k rcu we can do quite a bit more. And uh, um, so, yeah, in, it, it, we, we could have it look up things and do stuff. And if we do it instead of RCU keeping all these stats, first yeah. off, if we move it to the slab, yeah. then, it's, then it's tightly integrated and there's a bunch of other and nice that's things what we that can happen. Right? It's obvious, you look at the slab, it tells you how many objects are in flight. You can go straight from there to mm -hmm. what your strand, stranded memory amounts currently are. Last of all, might have something to say about slabs. I don't know. Yeah, I've heard uh, you know something about them. So we actually have a plan to optimize K, R, K3 RCU in the slab allocator, so okay. that, that we are slowly moving that way anyway. So okay. I think accounting there is no problem. So. The, the Just other, the call RCU general case mm -hmm. might be a problem. Yeah. The other thing that last I checked wasn't really worthwhile, but if you had in the slab, might be. Uh, right now, you just say K-free RCU, and it's only K-free, right? There's no, there's no uh, what, uh, I want to say the wrong name, I'm sorry. Uh, came of cash RCU free. Is that came of cash RCU free? I, I'm not saying the right mm, word. No, that's not necessary because we can K-free anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. K K After K slop was removed. Hmm. There may be some, uh, some call RCUs that could be turned into k free RCUs, and that'd be cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Thank you. There, there will be just problem to replicate uh, the k, k free RCU might sleep, mm -hmm. and it will have the same problems as k free RCU <laughs> might sleep that you need sometimes to allo allocate in order to free. Yeah, we just, uh, we just eventually call synchronize RCU if life is too hard, right? <laughs> and then they can just be freed immediately. So, okay, so I think we, what we're saying is we've got two separate problems. Um, one of them is, okay, you've got a system that's uh, loaded with memory, and, and clearly RCU is a big chunk of that. How do we account for that? And the answer now is poorly. Um, and we've got a way of making that better for, for K-free RCU. Uh, for call RCU, if there was a function that it could call that says, There's, here's something that's being passed to me. Um, now, that's going to be approximate because you can take linked lists and pass them as a chunk to call RCU. And all it's going to know about is the first thing, whatever it is. Okay. But that would be um, better than nothing, I think. Is there a, but is there a better way thing we could do with call RCU? I think well, K-free RCU, we've got a way to go. First go of all, I just want to say back to the call RCU. I mean, if you just want to see, you won't be able to know how much is in flight because said you just got a function pointer that's going to do something. I have a few call RCUs mm -hmm. that clears, you know, has a data structure that has like 10 different things that has to be freed. Yeah. So I'm not going to be using K-free RCU on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but instead, like I said, if you, at least you could measure you could find out what was in flight if you just want to see like how much is being in flight in um, total. Like I said, at the free time, you can know that these things are being called from a call RCU uh, callback, mm -hmm. and then just say these are things that were in flight. At least for statistical things, you could at least have an idea how much is being freed through call RCU. Okay, I think I'm we gonna, can also I'm just stick say something if... in, and I'm gonna let you go, Kent. I'm sorry to delay you a little bit. Um, so the, the thing is that you could give exact information. The caller invoking call RCU could go and traverse the data structure and, and tell the slab allocator, by the way, this, this, and this is now in flight, call RCU. Okay, go ahead, Kent, sorry. Uh, I, I think we can also just say, if you're doing your open, weird open-coded uh, K-free RCU with call RCU, we'll provide the hooks and it's on you to do the accounting. And if, like, like you just noted, we've got call RCUs <laughs> that should be K-free RCUs because they're just doing a KMM cache free. If we do a little bit of, of cleanup like that, we may not have that much left. 
Yeah, that could be. Although there's a lot of call RCUs that like mess with reference counts and do other funny things, but it's possible that even some of that can be taken care well, of. Well, if, if it's call RCU to drop a ref count, that's 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 a, a different situation entirely yeah. because we can't predict if that's going to exactly. be memory or not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and I think you're you're uh, giving me another reason why I agree with your bit about if you're calling call RCU, the caller has to do the accounting. RCU just doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, we're kind of at time almost. I think we can do, if, if one other person has some commentary, we can go with it. Um, and uh, I can't resist poking fun at Steve and saying, I made it through these slides not once, but twice. <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much, and have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>